Hello to everyone. Welcome to a new session of the Women of the Bible Speak. This is your pastor, Yeti. I hope all is well, that the weekend was fulfilling for the ones who are coming to this session, and that it gives you some baggage in a positive way. So welcome to all women, the seeker and any denomination, everyone. So it's Rahab today and write the scripture verses down from Joshua 2, 1 to 24 and chapter 6, verse 25. And then Hebrews eleven thirty one. And James 2.25 Esther and Rahab make an unlikely pair. One a queen, the other a prostitute. They lived some 700 years apart. Esther during the time of the exile in Babylon and Persia, after Israel had been essentially destroyed, and Rahab at the very beginning of Israel's founding as a nation. When Joshua and his troops were just starting to lay plans for taking Canaan, in fact, Rahab is the reason that Joshua's army was able to make its very first conquest. The city of Jericho, so you could say, she played an essential role in Israel's later glory and prosperity. But there was nothing glorious about Rahab's life, and if it was prosperous, it wasn't from money earned through an honest living. So, what on earth could this patient woman from an ancient Canaanite town, a prostitute as well, as a pagan, have had to do with the Jewish queen of Persia? Both women were critical to the survival of God's people placed divinely into positions and called upon the step to step up in a moment of courage. Like Esther's, Rahab's name points us to some important truths about her. In Hebrew and in most of the local Semitic languages, her name is Rahab. R E C H E V, Rachav, meaning he enlarged or he widens. It was a common image of fruitfulness, God enlarging the womb of a pregnant woman, thickening the ear of grain, making the fruit so swell and burst. In Rachav's case, the name has another meaning, to enlarge a land area because of her bravery at a critical moment. That's exactly what she helped Israel to do. And that was just the beginning. Rahab, the prostitute, is one of the ancestors of Christ himself. She married Salmon of the tribe of Judah and gave birth to to Boaz. You hear it? Boaz. The same Boaz who would go on to marry Ruth, the great grandmother of King David, which puts Rahab directly in the lineage of Jesus himself. Just like Esther, Rahab changed the world 
with one bold, decisive act. We meet her in Joshua 2. After some spies from Israel shows up at her front door. After 40 long years of wandering in the desert without any permanent home, the people of Israel had finally made their way in Canaan. They had become a nomadic people, the people who lived in tents. But they longed for a home. They had lost Moses and Joshua was their new leader. He would be tasked with taking a band of this perdit nomads and turning them into an army capable of fighting against the trained legions and fortified cities of Canaan. To the human eye, it probably looked like a hopeless mission. The Israelites couldn't match those ancient, sophisticated, well-supplied cities in weaponry or numbers. But after the death of Moses, Joshua had heard directly from God a powerful directive full of bold promises. You and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates. All the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Joshua 1, 2-6 This is no ordinary pep talk. In the next three verses, God says again, Be strong and courageous. Two more times, adding, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua 1, 7 and verse 9. That's where the spies come in. Joshua wanted to get a good look at what they were up against. So he sent spies into the mighty city of Jericho. Some scholars believe Rahab was not just a prostitute, but also an innkeeper. The odds are that she made a little money on the side by doing more for guests than just renting them a room. Whatever her loyalties were before the spies arrived, she was willing to protect this man on a mission. The king of Jericho was told, look some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So, the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the man who came to you 
and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. Joshua 2, 2-3 to Local inns were clearing houses for gossip, and it would have been a good idea for Joshua's spies to head to one first, not just to secure lodging for the night, but also to overhear the local news and find out what was going on in town. Unfortunately, news flowed in both directions. The king of Jericho got word that some strangers were in town, over at Rahab's place, and maybe asking too many questions. So he sent her messengers and demanded Rahab turn over her guests. Here's where Rahab made the decision that changed the course, not only of her own life, but of the entire trajectory of human history. She decided to lie to protect her guests, but it wasn't just any lie. It was a detailed one. She admitted that the man had stopped in but told the king's messengers, you just missed them. Rahab really sold it. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. Joshua 2 verse 5. But she had already hidden the spies on her roof. After sending the king's messenger on a wild goose chase, she returned to the roof for an illuminating chat. Before we go there, we have to ask the pressing question, why did Rahab go to all this trouble? Why did she make what appeared to be an impulsive choice to lie to the soldiers of her own king, putting herself on her entire family at tremendous risk? If the king's men had discovered that Rahab lied, her life would almost certainly have been in danger. Whatever due process there was in an ancient Canaanite city ruled by a despotic king, it's unlikely a prostitute innkeeper would have benefited. There's simply no denying that Rahab took an unbelievable chance. In explaining her decision to save them, Rahab told the man all she had heard of Israel and what a picture she painted. Word of God's favor over Israel had spread far and wide. Through those powerful accounts, God's miracles were paving the way for his people. I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the, I mean, dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon and Och, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is a God in heaven above and on the earth below. Joshua 2, 9 and 2, 11. Rahab knew the reputation of this people and their God. She recognized that God was not like the pagan gods of her day and community. So she struck a deal with Joshua's men in exchanging for the help and shelter she offered. They would spare her life and the lives of her family, knowing what she knew of their mighty God. There was no way she'd even consider turning the spies over to Jericho's king. Rahab knew their God was real and had the power to save her loved ones. Like Rahab, we all have to experience a moment 
when we fully understand the reality of God and his power to redeem us. It's the gift of faith, a gift Rahab was clearly given. Her profession, her nationality, nothing on the surface would have appeared to put her on the path to become a part of nation of Israel and into the lineage of Jesus himself. Yet God expertly crafted her story, leading Israel's brave spies to her doorstep and giving her courage when she needed it most. Together Rahab and the spies hatched a plan. Her in joined the wall of the city, so helping the spies sneak out was an easy task. She lowered them out her window on a rope and sent them on their way, advising them to hide in the hills until their pursuers gave up, knowing they would return with others in battle. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> she agreed to hang a scarlet cord in the window and to gather her family inside. That cord would serve a notice to Israel's troops not to harm a single person inside. When the great attack came, trumpets blasting, the people shouting, and the walls of Jericho crashing down, Joshua honored the word of his men. Because of Rahab's hospitality and faith in a God that up to this point was not her own, the city was taken. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her, because she had the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. Joshua 6, 25. To dwell in Israel was to become one of Israel's people, and it became Rahab's spiritual address, as well as her physical one. Her place there cemented through her faith and courage. Both Esther and Rahab made bold decisions to place themselves at risk for the sake of God's people. For Esther, a thoroughly assimilated young Jewish woman who largely hid who she was, revealing her identity and standing bravely before a king on behalf of God's people could have cost her everything. And yet she found the courage. Rahab did much the same. And for a people who were not yet even her own at times, but Esther and Rahab may have felt disconnected from the people of Israel. But the women's decision to place their own lives on the line made them key players at the crit critical points in the national survival. For Esther, this meant being celebrated as a great queen who redeemed all the Jews from death and destruction. For Rahab, it meant being adopted as one of God's own and becoming part of the bloodline of the royal family, part of the bloodline of Christ himself. As one of only three women mentioned in Matthew's genealogy, genealogy of Christ, Rahab was clearly important to early Christians. In fact, she is mentioned two more times in the New Testament, once in Hebrews and once in James, with each mention commanding her faith and bravery. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging 
to the spies and send them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. James 2, 25-26 This is a powerful message following just after the story of Abraham's faith, a faith so strong that he was willing to lay down his own beloved son on an altar. That's some pretty exalted company for a Canaanite prostitute from Jericho. James is reminding believers that faith without action is lifeless. Our faith is the intellectual framework that undergrids our Christianity, but unless we use it to step forward in obedience, it lacks real power to change us for the world around us. Rahab's faith was just a starting point, as it is for us Christians today. We presented, uh, when presented with a change to breathe life into our faith, will we respond as she did? Will we, like Rahab, understand that our faith must move beyond intellectual agreement and into action? We will all face those critical decisions. In John 16:33, Jesus himself warned his disciples, In this world you will have trouble. Yet, his very next words were, Take heart. Bookended by his unmovable truth, I have overcome the world. May that assurance be all we need when our Esther or Rahab moment arrives. So I will give you some questions. Esther and Rahab, the holiday of Purim, Esther 9, 17 to 19, is still celebrated by Jews today as a commemoration of Esther's triumph. It is traditionally celebrated as a day of fasting and joy, as it says in the Bible, with carnivals and costumes and partying. But there are lots of biblical holidays celebrated by the people of Israel. Passover, Leviticus 23, 4, 8, commemorating the Exodus, the Feast of Weeks, Exodus 34, 22. Commemorating the wheat harvest and later the giving of the law. The New Year Festival, Numbers 29, 1-6. Commemorating the beginning of another year. These are all joyful occasions too, but only Purim is celebrated with feasting and joy. What sets Purim apart from these other festivals? What about this day is worthy of such special joy from the people of Israel? So look those scripture verses up and discover it. Another one. There are several instances in the Bible where people lie in order to obtain a good outcome. Most often these people are women. Rahab lies to keep the soldiers away from the Hebrew spies. Joshua 2, 4-5 The Hebrew midwives in Egypt also lie. In Exodus 1, 15-21 Compare these two instances of lying and find ways they are similar and ways they are different. And another one. What would have happened if the midwives had told the truth? What would have happened if Rahab had told the truth? 
What are some other examples of families lies in the Bible? Lying is often a stratagem used by powerless people or people under threat. Are there any circumstances in which the Bible seems to be saying that lying is an acceptable strategy? Are there any circumstances in our own lives where we have relied on lying as the better option? So, there is some work for you to do. So here ends the story of Esther and Rahab. And these are the women of the Old Testament. Our next session will be from the New Testament, Mary and Martha of Bethany. Two pathways. Well, that is, of course, for another session. So, it's so beautiful and very difficult if you listen to the pathways of all these women from the Old Testament what they did, what they had to overcome, how hard their lives were, and how blessed when God steps in and changed their life and for the people of Israel. So, it's beautiful and powerful how God steps in also in our own lives. Maybe we listen to the voice that is saying to us how we can change the path in our own lives. How we can be there for people who come to us and ask advice. How we will step up in a certain way that our directions of our life will totally take another direction. I will end with the words of the encouragement of Joshua 1, 2 to 6. You and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to him, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittites country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Do you have to cross a river? Do you have to enter another country? This can all be spiritual, where we have to step over to a new direction. Let these words of our great God encourage you to take the step. May you be blessed by God, and may the peace of God be with you and stays with you. And may His light shine upon you and keep you safe. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy. In what time frame you are, there must always be something that gives your attention. This is your Pastor Yeti. Bye-bye.